Hello everybody, welcome to Tokyo. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the ease of entering into Japan for just about everybody, except for this country. Now, there are a bunch of other countries that require visas to enter into Japan, but there's one country in particular which I'm scratching my head to try to figure out why they don't let them in. And do we have any guests what that country could be? If you take a look at the statistics that Japan has here, let me pull this up here. So you can see the countries that came in 2019, um, most of them were from China and South Korea and Taiwan and Hong Kong. In fact, that was a great percentage of the pie. Maybe even 75% of tourists coming were from the neighboring countries, in particular China, which is crazy. Now in 2023, if we look at the data, and this comes from JNTO, you can see it shifted quite a bit. China is a much smaller percentage of the visitors here, and it makes up only maybe 57 or 8 percent. And the biggest rise is from the West, in particular the United States. So we've seen this shift in, in the countries that are visiting Japan right now. But one country that I don't see there is the most populous country in the world. Do you guys know what country that is? That's right. I don't see India anywhere in this tourism da data, which is crazy to me because you think with having more people than China now, in particular a rising, um, a lot of younger people with the rising income, that Japan would want more people from India to come here in particular right now. There should be a harder, stronger push, but they can't. It's to me, it's, it's mind boggling. South Korea, it's, it's not just Japan though. If we take a look at the requirements here, it says here the Japan tourist visa is the This is the single entry visa. It's hard to get, you have to go to the embassy, you have to make an appointment. Sometimes you can't make an appointment until, uh, you have to wait three months to get into the embassy to make the appointments. It's just such a hard procedure. They ask for your financials. It's really complicated to get in here and people are turned off by it. So it's like, what the heck? Make it visa on arrival. T Taiwan, there's a bunch of other countries that, okay, let's go this way. There are a bunch of other countries that allow Indian nationals to come in, not as many, but the people who do have passports and in India, the amount of people who have passports in the country is quite significant. You take a look at it right here. In 2015, India issued 12 million passports. So it's right behind China and the United States, but that is just a small fraction of the population. Only 7.2% of the, which is 60, 96 million people, which is about the same population as, as the entire country of Japan, which is crazy, have passports. So they're ready to come to Japan. now. They, J Japan has, Japan has these um, goals that they want to hit with tourism. They're really strong. I don't see how they do it without incorporating India and to some extent making it easier for Indonesia. Countries with younger populations, now is the time for them to build their brand within those populations. Now why, why the heck won't Indians, maybe it's because the Indians aren't, interested to come to Japan at all. So I asked my assistant this question in particular. I asked ChatGTP, why, why aren't Indians coming to Japan? And here, here's what ChatGPT told me. <laughs> it's just always kind of funny. So there might be several reasons why Indians might not visit Japan. Some of the factors include distance, cost, travel, language barrier, visa requirements, and cultural differences. One of them, which is actually pretty good, ChatGPT pretty much sums it up pretty good. But I always ask ChatGPT Chat twice, and it says here, um, yeah, pretty similar answer to this. But I, I think one of the reasons why is that there's just a lack of understanding about what Japan is with the majority of population in India. 
I think that it's pretty much established what Japan is with the population in, in the United States. There's been a lot of cultural exchange, in particular in the last 25 years since I came here. Before, I couldn't find sushi at all anywhere except in the cities in the United States. Now you can find sushi in the countryside, you can find sushi all over the place, and everybody knows that it's coming from Japan. Manga anime culture is quite strong there too. But within India, the young population absolutely, well, a lot of people absolutely adore manga anime and they're starting to get to know Japan, but it's just so hard for them to come to the place that they, they hope to come to. They're going to other destinations, which I think Japan should start to consider. Maybe it's a little bit too hard to get in here for the, those Indians that do have passports, right? I don't know, is it just me? What do you guys think? I'm curious. Here's some data just off of off of the internet. Let's look at the other way now because it's fascinating, the data. If you look at the, at where Japan has one of the strongest passports, Japan and Singapore. Um, I think Singapore is on the top now. They got one country added. I don't know what it was, but Japan will probably be, be back again soon. But these are the only countries in the world that require a visa for Japanese. The one thing that, that uh, is a head scratcher is probably China because Chinese, I think, have an easier time to get into Japan than Japanese do to get into China, which is odd. But I think it was a business decision by Japan, which is why if Chinese have an easier time to get visas to come to Japan, why can't Indians have the same thing, right? Why can't it be easier? Looks like it's gonna be raining. Uh, there's rain clouds in the air here. So for me, it's a head scratcher, really why some countries are, are prioritized over another. These are the countries, and none of them, I don't think any Japanese tourists would wanna go for a vacation. North Korea, Russia, South Sudan, Syria, they're not on my lists. Uh, Libya, Bhutan, Algeria, Afghanistan, Chad, Congo. <laughs> let's, be, let's be real about this, I don't know. All right, so here are here are the 29 countries with Japanese passports. Okay, hold on a second. So these are the countries that need a visa to visit Japan. Or, or sorry, these are the countries that are visa free to enter Japan. It is a huge list, but some of these countries like El Salvador, um, Honduras, they don't exactly have the highest income, do they? So, I mean, is it really an income issue or is it a political issue? You see some countries in there that maybe they're kind of head scratching like, uh, I don't know why, why it, it, it can't be just income only. So maybe it's diplomatic. And I think that this is probably the reason why. India makes getting a visa to come to Japan, I'm uh, sorry, India makes Japanese coming to India kind of hard. And I think it's, they still need to apply for an online visa so maybe if they were, were to, to get rid of that, it might be easier. But for Japan to hit those tourism numbers, I don't think that they could do it. Mostly very political, yeah. I don't think that they can do it without uh, India's help. And I think over the course of the next five years, you're going to see more Indian tourists around the world. Not just here in uh, Japan, but in the even in the United States, I think it's just gonna be inevitable because they have the younger population that's, uh, uh, coming up, same with Indonesia and, uh, and some other countries. They have a, an economy that's going to continue to grow and they're gonna travel more. And I think in China, those country they have, which is maybe China's biggest challenge. They don't have enough young people because of the one child policy to continue to work in the factories to keep the countries running without having an immigration into China. So that's gonna be a huge issue. And that one, the, as the population declines, so will the wealth, unless they find a way to do something about it. So India has a population that's increasing. So, you know, demographically, you can, you see where I'm going. For tourism, Japan's gotta reach out to countries with a, with a growing population. But more than that, I'm just gonna sit down here in the sun. They have to do it really soon. The reason why is because Indians including people in my family, don't know much about Japan. 
don't know much about Japanese history, don't know much about Japanese food. They know more about China and Chinese food and Chinese culture, and they can't, for the most part, associate what the differences are between South Korea, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Japan. For them, it's all kind of the same. For many people, in particular those that are out in the countryside, it's just not, they have zero exposure to Japan. And as Japan outreaches to the United States and all these other countries, which is great, they're not doing a very good job in India, which is supposed to be an ally of theirs. And this is going to have a long-term impact. Uh, how many times have your parents come to Japan? For me, um, my mother maybe four or five times, my father once. He doesn't like the, the long air flights, so I got to go the other way. That's the way it is. It's, good. it's an interesting question. Frank the Tank is here. Do Japanese wear shorts in public over summer? Um, they do. They do. Um, not so much in the city because I think it's a fashion thing. The city is one thing, but it goes with your own comfort level. All right. I, I come from a culture where shorts, I'm looking around. I see a lot of people wearing shorts, but you'll see here, um, you know, people will wear long pants as well. And it has nothing to do with the heat. It has everything to do with getting sunburned as well. And you'll see a lot of Japanese wearing long sleeve shirts and gloves just to avoid the sun. So getting sunburned is a big, and getting uh, spots on your skin is a big deal. So it's not so much about staying cool, it's about that. And getting darker skin is not seen as a beautiful thing in Japan. It's just, for me, I, I like it. Shane is here, it's hot out there, be sure to drink often. All right, Shane, let's go to a vending machine. Let's put Shane's super chat to the use here. I'm looking at some of the questions here. Thanks, Frank, for the for the question. Um, we're gonna play dumb on the real question. I well, well, why don't you tell us what it is? I don't see. If you if you think I'm missing something, don't play games. Write the question. Write the answer. What do you think it is? Are Japanese still using masks even outdoors? Um, it's about thirty percent right now. They're not wearing masks. A lot of businesses require that the workers wear masks. Um, there's a vending machine over here. A lot of Japanese workers require that they wear masks, in particular, the delivery people. That's gotta be really hot. I was at the media event in Fukushima yesterday and the day before. Some of the media, in particular NHK, required at events, which is so dumb. It's just so backwards and it was oppressively hot. I felt bad for them, but you know, they get a job to do. So they keep put their head down and get the job done. Yeah, there are typhoons coming It's summer. It's inevitable. That's part of something you have to consider. Always, when you book a trip to Japan, go back a day early, earlier than you have to work because there's a high chance that you're, well, there's a, a good chance that your flight will be delayed. Um, or canceled because of a typhoon. There's not many options here. All right, there's a vending machine over here. All right. So, and here's an here's an Indian restaurant right here, right there. So here's another thing that I found really interesting. So I, I have some Indian friends here in Japan and I asked them a little bit about what people are interested in. Like, do they eat Indian food in Japan? And the answer was not really. They'll cook for themselves because the prices at Indian restaurants are so high comparatively, it just seems like, and the quality is not the same, it just seems like a ripoff. That's what one of my friends said. It's like, you can get, you can get this in India for like, I don't know, like 25 yen. And then here it is for like $10. So for them, you know, my Indian friends don't eat at Indian restaurants quite a bit, uh, quite often, which is a little bit crazy. Let's see what they got here. <laughs> How do I turn this camera around? I don't see the camera turnaround option. Oh, there it is. So 
So this is a, this is a, um, what is it? Looks like Asahi. So we've got some uh, coffee here. Lemon cashews, cash, uh, squash, craft cola. Wow. Should I try craft cola? It sounds interesting. I know I'm not gonna drink the whole can. All right, let's 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 go for it. Asahi makes a craft cola. What do you guys think? Let me know in the, let me know in the comments right now. Get the craft cola or not. All right, that's option number one. Let's go to this other machine. Um, oh, this is only 100 yen, price down. Mount Fuji water, lemon, Bocati sweat miniature, what? They got black coffee here. 100% uh, apple juice. I'm not trying that, that's the melon soda. Right now it looks like water, orange juice, iced coffee in a can. That's something. Dude, this topic is so interesting. Well, thank you, yeah. I think so too. All right, we'll try this uh, craft coffee. I will not be drinking the whole thing. I'm just gonna taste it. Gotta stay hydrated. I'm kind of curious. Or maybe this tea looks good. This is Japanese black tea. And Mugi Cha. Oh yeah, I'm gonna get Mugi Cha. That's only 100 yen. That's my 10 yen, and it's healthy. This is Mugi Cha. Mugi Cha is barley tea. You'll see this in the summer. It is so cheap. It's cheaper than water. You get 600 milliliters of it um, compared to 500 milliliters for this water, which is the same price, which I don't understand how that makes, oh, this is 600 milliliters, I'm wrong. But I, I don't understand how this is the same price as water. And it says it's Juroku Cha. So it's made from the, com made from the brand of or it's made from 16 different teas, but it's, it says Mugi Cha here, right? Doesn't it? Man, Mugi Cha is good. Right, let's drink. Let's drink it here as we. Uh, I take some of your questions. Yeah, sometimes alcohol can be cheaper than water. It also can be safer than water. So back in the, uh, some of the, hi I, I love history. So I, I uh, see a lot of historical documentaries. One of the things that I, I learned from Ken Burns was back in the day, uh, like we're talking the 19th century, water was not pure, it was dirty. So a lot of people in the olden days would drink whiskey and alcohol because it was safer than the water. And there are a lot of countries where this is actually the case, where you would be drunk all the time just because it was safer to drink instead of getting sick. And why not get drunk? It feels kind of funky. So <laughs> this culture, Japan is one of the only Asian countries that wherever you go in the country, anywhere, you can drink the tap water. This is a fact. I think South Korea, there might be some places where that's not true, but South Korea for the most part is also one of these other countries. Probably Taiwan as well, you can throw in there. Um, but there might be places where it's not the case. Even on remote islands, Japan has purifiers where the water uh, is coming out, even like Aogashima has water you can drink from the tap, which is, which is amazing. Um, yeah, Singapore probably, but that's such a small country. Um, I'm not 100% I'm not not sure on that, but I'm sure Singapore is one of those countries too. But. Uh, Japan is one of the only, one of the few, few. Barley, barley tea is kind of nutty tasting. It's got a lot of minerals, so it's great for the summer. Um, I, I don't think it replaces water, but it is really refreshing and not, not many calories if, if at all. No caffeine. This has no caffeine. So, Gotta love barley tea. Yeah. Um, what about Indian tap water? <laughs> All right. I got. I almost died in India. I, I ate um, 
a fish curry on the streets in Calcutta before a train from Chennai, uh, from from Cal Kolkata to uh, Chennai, which used to be called Madras. Uh, this is about 20 years ago, 22 years ago, and I ate this curry in Calcutta right before I got on the train, and. In route, I started feeling extremely sick. And about a third of the way in there, I thought I was gonna die. I was going to the restroom all the time, very little, I needed electric lights. Uh, there were other passengers on the train that were helping me. There were pharmacies on the platform. I was able to get bottled water to stay hydrated. I got to Chennai and I was, I, the, I stayed there and like one day just completely recovering and really sick. The next day, super weak and was able to still get around because I was young. And then when I got to Bangalore, my friend's family, mother and father are both doctors. So I got some pretty good TLC, tender loving care, and I recuperated pretty good. Enough that we could drive to, to Goa and uh, see the sights. But man, I thought I was, I was gonna, if I didn't have help, I would have died from food poisoning. Um, I don't know what it was, but the pharmacies there were able to, to kill it. Probably acid, I don't know what it was. But you don't wanna drink the, the, the tap water in India. Some places might be okay. In particular, down in the south of India, they're a little bit better with that. In the north, it's a little bit harder, but I would be suspect. Um, I love India. I, hopefully we can take uh, Leo and, and Kanai um, there next year. That'd be great. Um, yeah. Dave Starr writes in here, I'm visiting Tachikawa next month from Australia with my family. Do you recommend Summerland? I do not. Not in the summer, maybe. I don't know if you, it's, I think it'll still be in during September. It's just too crowded. I know that it went viral, this wave pool, where you can't see any water, you just see people. It is one of the most viral clips from 15 years ago when YouTube started of Japan was Summerland's wave pool. But I've been there once, it was too crowded. It was seemed a little dirty because it's just too many people and it wasn't fun. But if you want to stay cool, it's an option. The Hawaiians and Iwaki up in Fukushima is a better water park. And then there are some water parks that are even better. Fuji Q Highland, I think, has a water park next to it as well. Dave, thanks for the question. I mean, but if you don't have anything else to do, if you don't have anything else to do, it's almost worth it to go to Summerland. I mean, like, why not? Wow. All right, I saw, I, I thought I saw a pigeon there. <laughs> that was funny. It's like, whoa. Food poisoning is very scary. It's something you should be worried about. I just saw an alley I wanted to take you guys down. Here we go. It's so hot out here. Some of these alleys are um, probably not going to be around much. They're really destroying this neighborhood. Oh, wow. They are. Oh, this is sad. So they're starting to take out these older Nagaya. And you can see this empty plot. And here, they've destroyed some of these row houses. I'm gonna have to come and make an episode in this neighborhood. Oh, this is awful. I come here quite often. Look at this. Oh my gosh, they took them all out. They took them all out already. Do you see this? This used to be like an old post-World War II uh, Nagaya and they're all gone. Holy smokes. Hey John, will you do a stream on the big Suica 
Passmo chip shortage. I, I don't, I, I don't recognize that though. I, I, I haven't heard too much about it recently. So I'll, I'll, I'll look into it. Maybe we'll do a live stream on it. You can see here, these community pumps are still here. I don't, that would be sad if they got rid of this. I don't know if it still works. This one seems to be off because of the uh, ongoing construction in the area, but that's sad. This is an old um, Showa era pump, probably erected after World War II, um, where residents living in these kinds of houses here could get water, but they're no longer here. I, I'm so shocked. I was not expecting these buildings to be missing. I was hoping to film here and actually get a tour. All right, I guess there's not a lot of time left to do stuff like this, so. And like these houses didn't have plumbing. It's probably easy to plow, plow them down. They, they had sent electricity, but no plumbing. And the people living there were all like 70 to 90. Yeah. That's a shame. All right, so I'll take uh, one more question here. They're quite good. Uh, just to put a ribbon on this whole uh, at whole chat with, with India. Um, yeah, so these are the countries that can get short-term visa stays exemptions. There's 69 countries that can come here with visa exemptions to Japan. I think I showed this earlier. Some countries, um, are more prosperous than others in that sense. But I think just having good di diplomacy with the two with these countries is also quite helpful uh, to do that. So those are the only countries there. Uh, Indonesia has a, like some kind of special waiver going on, but it's not the best in there. And for Indians going to South Korea, you can see here, they must also for South Korea get a, a uh, uh, in-person visa application, which is another reason why I think if Japan is competing with Korea, they better, they better open this up to India. This was updated just a few days ago because I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, Korea is a much stronger brand than Japan in, in India because of the appliances. Sony used to be a big brand in India, but over the last 10, 15 years, Samsung has become huge. And it has to do mostly with the smartphones because most people in India have Android phones and not iOS because of the costs. And their smartphones, from Samsung, they do a big boost to Korea and people wanting to go to there because it's the, the country that they hear more than they hear about Japan. So I thought that was quite interesting. So if there, there is something of a competition between the two countries based on that. Can I just cross the street? If you take a look at the sun, at the, uh, hold on a second. If you take a look at the um, sky, it does look like, it does look like a thunderstorm is coming. See that? Maybe it's a typhoon. I don't know. Yeah, but I'm, I'm very shocked at this, guys. I'm a little bit nostalgic. Maybe it's because of my age, but I don't, I, I feel sad when, when I see that you know, rows of houses, older houses being torn down. But that's Tokyo. Tokyo is always inventing itself and there's always new things coming here. And it is getting windy, Saya. Ah, uh, all right. Well, thanks, thanks everybody. Uh, I can't, so do I have any, any other charts that, that were interesting? That's kind of an interesting chart. I'll go over the, I'll go over an episode with the data I think that JNTO released the data last month and there's some really interesting numbers for the first half of 2023. Let's go over that in another live stream in August and see how the trends for travel to Japan have changed. Because I think with you, a lot of people booking the trips to come here to Japan, it's interesting to see how the travel has changed in the last four years because after the pandemic, it's different. It really is. All right, everybody, thanks for going. And Nightbot, thanks for reminding me. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, Here's the QR code on the screen here. Uh, I, I do encourage you guys, if, if you do have time, uh, sign up and you're gonna be in Japan in September. We're going to do a bus tour to Katakai, which is one of the great fireworks festivals of Japan. Uh, this includes an accommodation for the night. I'll be with you, which is awesome. We can do karaoke on the speaker system. I don't know, we're gonna have some fun. Um, I know we have, what, eight or nine people, couple more people just signed up. 
but this is the uh, we'll be staying uh, at a hotel and then having breakfast together and then going to a koi um, fishery hatchery also to pick up some of the koi and learn some of the history of the birthplace of, of Japanese carp on the way back to the station to catch the Shinkansen together so it'll be a nice little ex uh, trip we can only do 30 people and the deadline for this is this month I think it's about 10 days from now so we're gonna I'm gonna be doing a strong push to try to get to 30 people as, as fast as we can here um, moments by Subha, thank you. I, I will absolutely, I will do that. I said, get something for Leo. I will do that. He's at he's at um, uh, preschool Hoikuen right now. So he'll be back at five o'clock and I will take him. You know what he wants? He always wants a coconut from the supermarket and I got to hack it to get it open. So I'm gonna go get him a coconut and we'll share it together. And uh, I think they still have them, but he loves fruits. So I'll, I'm gonna use that to get some good fruit for him. Thank you for that. He's gonna be really happy. And Frank the Tank, post COVID travelers more or less respectful. Yes. Um, I found that as I've been traveling around the country quite a bit over the last few months in particular, yeah, I, I haven't heard of any issues. Um, nothing big. Travelers are pretty respectful. And I think that, you know, the tourism industry in Japan has matured quite a bit over the last 10 years and you're starting to see um, even though with staff shortages the people who can speak English are more numerous than they were it's not enough but it's more numerous than it was 10 years ago and I think it's 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 bridged the gap of some of the misunderstandings because before it gets to a misunderstanding there's someone who can speak English to, to help people out and there are more restaurants that have menus the ex and there are more experiences for foreign visitors than there were in 2019 in English. And this is a good thing. I, I was shocked at how many more experiences that you can have that were things you were looking for where entrepreneurs stepped up and created it. And this is a good live stream for August as uh, this is a month where a lot of tourists are coming in here. We can talk about those types of issues here. I think that's really cool. And I'll be filming that. Um, but on the, I'll be going to Nara and Kagoshima at the end of this week. So, uh, sorry, on the weekend. So I'll have some live streams from Nara uh, in uh, August and in Kagoshima. And I, I rent a car and go down to uh, the coastal areas of Kagoshima. That's going to be really cool. So I'll take you with me on this channel. So don't forget to subscribe. And uh, um, yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. Do you like sumo? I, I do, but I'm not a big fan of it. I don't follow it very much. I prefer baseball here. But it's something that a lot of people are getting into and it's definitely only in Japan. So expect a, a couple of sumo episodes either this early winter or next year going into summer. I've got uh, several ideas for sumo episodes with collaboration with other YouTubers visiting Japan, by the way. Yeah, Jason. Kagoshima, baby. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I'm flying Skymark too because ANA didn't have any flights. That's crazy. I, I'm leaving from Itami, though. Or, no, I think it did get ANA. Yeah, there were no flights from Tokyo, so I'm leaving from Itami from, straight from Nara to go to Kagoshima via Itami, which is going to be uh, a pretty crazy one. Fun. I, and I'll probably do a live stream at Itami Airport in Osaka. All right, everybody, I got to go. It looks like the rain is going to be coming really soon. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions in particular with uh, um, the tourists that are having issues coming into Japan, let me know because I'm going to follow up on this as time goes on because I, I think the key to J Japan hitting its tourism goals will come from la relaxing entry to some countries, in particular India, where they need to grow the Japan brand in order to get more people to come here because I just see a, a really bright future for India despite all of the challenges it has. Every country has them. But it's the world's biggest democracy and, you know, I'm half Indian, so half American. Does that make me American Indian? No, it doesn't. Native American, American Indian, it's just, it's weird. Growing up as a kid, I got a lot of, uh, it wasn't it wasn't easy always. <laughs> just because of the face, I look different. It's like, are you Mediterranean? I'm like, I could be. Which one do you prefer? Doesn't matter. But the more I get to learn about my background in India, the more I would just say yes. There you go. Don't forget that QR code if you're coming to Japan. Definitely sign up. If you have any questions about the trip, you can let me know. I'll see you in another live stream. Maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow. I'll be back soon. Bye, everybody.